Streaming live from Treaty One territory in the heartland of the Métis Nation, the place where the great waterways meet and the heart of Turtle Island. We have guests from the territory of Toronto, which is grounded in the Treaty of a Dish with One Spoon and is home to some of the most diverse population in Canada. We also have a guest from Joe Joggy and Australia. I'm so excited to host the eighth Nui Blanche talk series, Digital Pivoting. Yes, I said it, Pivoting, Overuse of the Screen. We have some incredible speakers on this topic. And first up is Brooke Andrew, who's the Artistic Director of Naren, the 22nd Biennale of Sydney in Australia. He's an artist and also a professor at Monash University. Next up, we have Emily Fitzpatrick, Artistic Director of Trinity Square Video and has been an independent curator and arts administrator in Toronto. Then we have Jason Lewis, who is a professor and research chair in computational media and the Indigenous Future Imaginary at Concordia University in Montreal, which there's been some debate if it's the best or not. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we'll see. Uh, then we have Nikki Little, who's the artistic director of Imaginative uh, Film and New Media Festival in Toronto, which is the largest festival of its kind in the world. And next we have Anna Serrero who is the president and vice chancellor of OCAD University and past chief digital officer of the Canadian Film Centre with a track record as a global leader and visionary in digital media. And finally, we have Ra LL, who is a media and performance-based artist and is one of our featured artists for Nuit Blanche 2020-2021. Tonight is bittersweet as we wind down the talks and uh, finish sections of Nuit Blanche, like Nuit Live and Nuit in Your Neighbourhood. Uh, we are contemplating what we are left with these huge shifts of the virtual realm. Tonight, our guests have extensive knowledge in digital media and or as well work in the area of moving exhibitions online. I'm excited to dialogue tonight about the panic, everybody shifting to the virtual and having to or validations of existing work in digital media. We'll question the visual and the political through the digital fold, how we've had to shift to presenting exhibitions and events digitally, situated in the intersection of public closures, growing demands for racial justice, the speakers will work to reflect on their past work and political commitments. They will openly engage with the complexities of safety, representation and inclusion to foreground a new digital world we are moving towards. Like it or not, AR, VR, MR, AI are quickly taking a strong presence in our global society. And tonight's conversation is going to be fascinating and exciting to reflect on this new age of media. I think it's best if we start with Brooke and his rapid response to the shifting of a massive exhibition with thousands of people this March in the city of Toronto who had, who had to return home. And some of us on this call were actually <laughs> part of that. So I think Brooke, if you wanna start us off and talk a little bit about um, some of the work that you set up for Naren and its importance of situating it as the first kind of indigenous artist centered uh, version, I think will be super fantastic place to start. Yeah, my Julie and everyone, um, it's really great to be here. And uh, I'm zooming in from the lands of the Wurundjeri and in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, it's really great to be here and to talk about, yeah, the kind of uh, excitement of the digital platform, but also that incredible shift. So Nidden is the 22nd Biennale in Sydney. It just closed, actually. We did... Uh, when I, when I say just closed, it physically did close, but then it did open again as well. So I think it's the longest running Biennale, even it had a little holiday in the middle. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so in some ways we've been very lucky, but of course, you know, some international people couldn't see it. Um, the image you see behind me is from um, Kunmanara Mumu Mike Williams, who's a Pitanjara artist from uh, the Western Desert. And uh, you'll see that actually he, we worked with Apple to create this um, augmented reality translation of his Pitanjara language. And these are banners that were hung up when we work very closely with his community. And I think that the pivoting of kind of when the Biennale did have to go online um, was very important, especially for remote communities, because a lot of people couldn't come and travel because it costs a lot of money across vast territories of Australia, but also internationally. So in some ways, this kind of shift to, you know, online was really great. Also working with technologies like augmented reality meant that, you know, these artworks could actually travel through time and space without actually physically traveling the work. 
as well. You know, we kind of had, could use different indicators for that. Um, and also within the catalogue. And I think it's really important to echo what you're saying about creating safe places, especially for First Nations um, and artist-led uh, biennales or initiatives or you know artistic kind of events because often the issues especially today when there's urgency around you know sovereignty the decolonial you know issue that we're really finally getting our you know getting our hands dirty with um <laughs> also around queerness um around monuments i mean all of that kind of the environment i think i've mentioned that uh it's important to create safe environments. And I think that what, that's one thing we really did within Nidin. I mean, it was all for the public to see as well, um, even on the website. And so when we did have this statement from traditional elders about how we could kind of draft these, um, these messages, they were absolutely now part of the digital platform. Um, I think that also now that some artists have, you know, uh, working on their own uh, digital uh, extension of really works that were in the Biennale too, it has been a real uh, kind of uh, energy, you know, behind this and build up. And, and in fact, uh, Nidan has traveled to Melbourne now, but on a digital platform. So we're creating a, a film program now, which I'll, you know, share with you all, which is really exciting, uh, especially that most people from around the world couldn't see a lot of those films, but of course, film is one of those more easier um, you know, uh, kind of medium, so to speak, that can actually move to an online platform. Yeah, I think also too, I think if you want to expand a little bit about, you know, the, the fact that you guys had to close and then you were doing a really incredible job of kind of like giving a virtual tour, right? So, um, and I think that that would be important for a lot of people listening is that, you know, I think that you, there were a lot of talking heads so, you yeah. know, as soon as the pandemic hit, you know, I, I was making jokes that if I had to see another older uh, lady talk about the importance of their collection and their uh, museum space, I was like going to fall, fall asleep. So I think that you guys did just such a great job of like really critically engaging um, your viewership, but also giving kind of context about the different work. And, and, yeah. and I mean, and I guess it helps that you had the physical space, but I, if you want to expand on that, I think it would be great. Yeah, and I think that, that what you're, I think that you're also hinting at too is that it, because it is indigenous led and artist led, the kind of the indigenous philosophies that were um, built within the actual structure meant that even, even through public programs um, and tours were, had to be kind of, in, you know, through those protocols and through those uh, systems of presentation, which are very different to your kind of traditional way of presenting. Even Tony Albert's work, um, an Aboriginal artist from Australia. This is his work behind me. It's called Healing Land. Um, and it was very, you know, you did have to get your hands in there literally with seeds and plant seeds. And then these seeds would be sent to places around Australia, um, like the Blake Town Native Institution, which is the first site of removal of Aboriginal children in early colonial times. And of course that had to go online then. And so, you know, how is it that, you know, these experiences were really captured, you know, how is it that people would share that experience um, and also that journey for the artist and that definitely did happen online. Um, you can see a lot of the Biennale online now, you can get these walks and these tours that are artist led that are Indigenous led, uh, the beginning of every uh, uh, event was led through ceremony as well and that also shifted to, to the online platform too and I think it's really important what you're saying about who is speaking for whom and how is it that we talk and that you know, how that's translated to an online platform I think is really important to keep that integrity and I think that often when you do transform something to an online platform you think how do you decolonize that space or how do you take that journey with you you know, that creates a, a, not only a safe place, because safe is such a loaded term, it means many things to different people, but how is it that, you know, people feel like, yeah, I have ownership over that, or, you know, I can kind of identify with that still, even within uh, an online platform. I, one other thing that I'd love to share as well is, uh, so this is Nirangé, which means uh, to see the edge. So this is uh, Wiradji language, which is my mother's language group from Western New South Wales. And I worked with um, artists and designers to create uh, the catalogue. So we had two catalogues. Uh, we had the kind of 
or traditional catalogue, so to speak, and then we have a reader, artist book, and they've actually translated this online now. So you can actually go to Nid and Nay and you can see all of the artists, all the international artists, um, works, poetry, you know, um, social political kind of uh, uh, movements, etc. within this kind of tightly bound um, curated uh, uh, catalogue. And I think that they've the artists have done such an extraordinary job and they did this post Biennale. They did it, you know, without, um, what I mean by post Biennale, I mean like post no more money left. Do you know what I mean? Post, oh, okay, things are online now. So, they, so like I mentioned before, artists are still continuing with their projects, but they're putting it online themselves or, you know, aspects of that. So I think that there has been a real collaboration and I think that's really important. Um, that kind of working together, which is a very important theme um, of Nidin as well. Absolutely, and I think that's important. I think it's going to be a good spot for Jason to pick up, who's got a long-standing uh, relationship with computational media and has been working hard in in that realm for a long period of time. And I think it'll be great for you to expand on some of the work that you've done in the past and then how it lends itself uh, to our current climate. Uh, so thank you, Julie, and uh, thank you everybody who for turn, who's tuning in for joining us. Um, I actually have to take care of a very, just give me a second, okay? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> a child. I know it. I can yes, see it in your face. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> I locked mine out. I locked the door and they can't come in. <laughs> Eldest literally took exactly the moment you introduced me to like crank the TV on upstairs. So anyways, uh, so yeah, so we've, we've, you know, we've been working sort of in virtual spaces for over 20 years now. Um, and when I say we, I'm talking about uh, my wife and collaborator, Scawinati as well, uh, who started uh, Cyber Pow Wow 1996, uh, which was the first online exhibition or online gallery uh, to showcase indigenous work and um, and sort of been kind of evolving since there. And for the last 12 years, we've had a, a presence in cyberspace called Abtech Island. And so this is in the virtual environment called Second Life, uh, which is a full sort of 3D world that you can go into. You have an avatar uh, that you can customize and uh, and then you can build things in that space. So we, um, we own, well, we don't own, we lease. We lease an island in Second Life. As Kawanadi says, real Indians paying uh, virtual money uh, for virtual land. Um, and uh, we originally established it actually kind of as a, as a movie set for Skawanadi's machinima practice, uh, movie making and virtual environments. But over time, as we got to sort of know it more, we sort of started thinking of it as a kind of a permanent outpost in, in cyberspace. In the last four years, we've really pushed on that. We have um, every, it's now every Friday afternoon, it moves around a little bit depending on what's happened in the semester. But once a week, we have a two hour session where there's a couple of us that are there in the world um, and we invite everybody to come and join us and we show them how to customize their avatar and how to build things and how to move in that virtual space. Um, and then uh, uh, for one of Skabonati's machinima, she, she, she created a, a, a gallery that she called Museum of the Future. And she populated it with uh, artworks from uh, some of our, you know, our most talented indigenous artists uh, for, the, for her movie shoot and for machinima. And so when COVID hit, we thought, okay, you know, why don't we actually sort of turn it into a real gallery, I mean, start having shows there on a regular basis. And so the first thing that we did is that we basically took that show that had been put up for the shoot. We asked all the artists if they would be interested in, in having that be a real show, show, and they all agreed. And so uh, we launched the first uh, show in, I think it was August, or maybe it was July of this year, uh, and had a, you know, had a digital vernissage and everything like that. We did tours. Um, and we then uh, launched our second show here in September, and we're going to have, um, and uh, we immediately when we launched it, we started getting inquiries from lots of different people about sort of our experience in the virtual and 
as an exhibition space, as a making space, as a teaching space. And so that was really, that was really interesting. Um, uh, and it's led to the third show is actually going to be people who approached us and made a proposal to us about uh, they're really interested in using the space for an exhibition. So um, I think that, you know, what part of what's interesting to me is this question really trying to think hard through this question of, you know, why, I mean, it's different now because it's COVID and there's not a lot of choices, but one of my questions always is, is like, why do you, you know, why, what motivation do you have for making people come to a screen, yeah. right? So, you know, as opposed to pick up a book, right? Or go out to a gallery in a physical space or what it might, whatever it might be. So what is it about these environments that we can leverage um, that are difficult to do or maybe impossible to do in the, in the real world? You know, so, you know, the obvious ones like interactivity, um, uh, time shifting, um, you know, being able to create fantastical worlds that people can inhabit, you know, so there's lots of interesting answers to that. But one of the things that I, I try to always ask and encourage the people who are coming to us to ask themselves is, you know, really a deep question of why do this, right? So what is it, what are you, what is your audience going to get out of it? Because it's still, it's still challenging for a lot of people, right? There's challenges on the resource side, they may not have good equipment, they may not have good connectivity, they may not have to use the technology very well. So, you know, for some non-trivial part of your audience, particularly, I think, when we're working with Indigenous communities, you know, you might be creating quite a barrier for them to participate and, and enjoy the work that you want them to see. Um, you know, uh, what kind of environment are you going to construct for them to be in? Is it, how are you going to navigate it? Um, uh, cause a lot of times people like the first impulse is to recreate mm -hmm. what was supposed to be in the real world. Right. And, um, that doesn't work. Right. You got to think it's sort of like we were, I was talking, one of the research centers just down the hall from me is a mobilities research cluster. And so they think a lot about, you know, uh, uh, you know, people who are differently able, the elderly, et cetera and how to make things accessible. And we were talking about how that it's kind of, in some ways it's a little bit of that mindset is that you gotta kind of take what you think you know and a bunch of assumptions you make about how to move through space, how to look at things and things like that and actually kind of rethink them um, for this flat plane, you know, that people are trying to access uh, access your, your exhibition or your workshop or whatever it might be for. So, uh, but it's also super exciting. I mean, there's way more people coming and visiting now than there was before. <laughs> uh, you know, we'll take it. Um, it's exciting that there are people coming to us. It's super exciting that we're going to be working with somebody else for the next exhibition. It's going to be a learning experience for us, I think, to figure out how to support that, right? Because it involves, you know, we, I am very blessed that I work with an incredibly talented crew of student research assistants. Um, and so we're going to have to get them involved. They're going to have to, you know, build sets, basically build out the space and customize that space. And we're going to have to imagine what it is, you know, and then think through all these different questions. And um, I went from being like, okay, you know, this is, this will, this will be kind of cool. Let's try it and see what it's like to now I'm super jazzed, you know, and I'm excited to like do programming out for the next two or three years. Um, and sort of see what we can what we can make of it. Uh, so um, I think that's probably, you know, I think that's good for an opening, anyways. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you squish like twenty years into like a little like five minute bubble? Yeah, and I'm gonna drop the I'm just gonna drop the URL Perfect. into uh, the chat there. Um, oh, that's just the participants. Oh, I can't send it to. Oh, yeah. Here we go. End attendees. There you go. Okay, so I was thinking it's a good spot for Raw for you to pick up and talk a little bit about because I think that, you know, there's some nice parallels with some of the work that uh, Jason and Scalonati are doing and your, you know, um, you know, a net uh, based artist and performance artist and does video and so I think like, you know, the lot of your characters and practices, I would say lend themselves to avatars actually, if that, you know, and I, and I know for, you know, for Nui Blanche, we had your beautiful blue girl work as a VR work and um, showcased um, your uh, past video work and performance work, uh, Supernova. So I think it'd be great if you want to talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, great. I actually just um, had a talk with Scawanati last week as part of my exhibition in Montreal that closed down after five days. Oh. Uh, well, it's there is a vitrine display now, but yeah, what a shame. I was there and it was like, we're in yellow zone, we're in green zone, we're in red. Oh, no, it's shut down altogether. But so it's pretty disappointing, disheartening after, you know, you know how long it takes to plan these things and, and to mount the show. But anyway, yeah, so the work there is, is Supernova and, and I'm also showing that at uh, Nuit Blanche as a, a kind of virtual screening. And then the the Blue Girl VR work, which was meant to be, uh, you know, a, a three channel um, like panoramic video installation um, and to adapt it to VR was really interesting and even added like another like surreal quality. It, it was even more surreal and, and bizarre. So um, yeah, and I think the shift from, for me as an artist, I, I working digitally and then having the net art practice through like the character Oreo and whatnot, it's always a real challenge to um, adapt the work to a gallery setting because you're trying to like, emulate the, you know, the aesthetics of the, the uh, interface um, and that, that, yeah, so it, to create it for a gallery setting is a lot more challenging than to just leave it on the kind of democratic space of the internet where everyone has access to it. But, and then, you know, again, there's the interactivity of, of got that kind of engagement on uh, with cyber art. So, um, yeah, I don't, I'm kind of rambling. I don't, what was your question? <laughs> Sorry. I, was thinking, I just think you could talk a little bit. And I think it's important that you talk a little bit about your practice. And I think that how it's been impacted, obviously you just said you just opened an exhibition, you know, and, and for that down. you decided to go entirely virtual because the, you know, partly because when we were in um, Sydney, you know, the, the decision of like, having working towards an exhibition in, in real space and then going to a code red wasn't something that I was super uh, excited about. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, you've been able to translate your work into a digital realm because you, you already work in that, in that medium, right? Yeah, I do. And the work is available as a single channel, so it can be screened online. So it, it's flexible in that way that, the, for example, the installation at the Kiel is two channels, or you could have like Blue Girl as a, as a three channel large installation where you're immersed in it, or you could do a VR and be immersed in it that way. So, um, and I think immersion is, is an important part of that work because there's a sense of like embodiment that the, the women experience and to, to trying to get the, the viewer to feel that, I don't know, um, like I always find like my work is very maximalist. I like to bring in everything, all the lights and really overwhelm, uh, the viewer with, with the seduce them, bring them in, but then also, you know, uh, kind of ambush them with, <laughs> with, uh, difficult issues in, in an accessible way as well with, with the humor and, and the characters and all of that. So, yeah. And then there's the characters themselves. I mean, um, to be able to use, uh, digital compositing and, and to film everything on green screen and to put them into one place, into one space, imagined, uh, space together is really effective because it allows me to um, talk about the nuances of, of my experiences, but also it provides like a nice stage to critically examine these characters side by side and also allow them to interact with one another. And I think that that is um, a really like exciting um, part of my practice where I'm able to do that, to, to bring all of these, to create these worlds, but also to bring all these characters. And then you show the, the tension between them and, and the nuances and the performance and all of that as well, so. Yeah, and I think it's really important because you you construct those characters physically, you know, in, in Supernova, they become like embodied characters, but yeah. in Blue Girl, they are actually, they, they look like digital renderings, you know, whether they've been shot as real people with green screen that have then been altered. But I mean, they give you that feeling of that kind of futuristic kind of alien like uh, characters, right? That aren't, that, that are real, but not our normal day to day. <laughs> Yeah, and they're very glitchy. I mean, with Coco, you get a lot of that kind of glitch art with the layering of the character through the dancing and, and the character moves across channels, whereas the others are just kind of static. But there is always a kind of digital component, whether it's changing the the voice um, somehow, like uh, 
the high pitched vocal of uh, Oreo versus the lower pitched vocal of, of Sirius, and then the the generated text to uh, voice of Bellatrix. So there's a there's a lot of kind of room for digital exploration there through through the voice and physicality of the characters. So it's yeah, it's very exciting. For sure. I think it's a good time we can get Anna to talk a little bit about uh, some of your past work at the Canadian Film Centre and then also your new work as the as the OCAD president. So I think that, you know, you're leading the helm of two really strong, um, you know, I made the argument of one of the leading schools in, in Canada in terms of uh, digital art and media. And, uh, and I'd say the same thing with the Canadian uh, Film Centre. It's, it, you know, it's got a really strong presence of that. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of that work. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I want to talk about how basically I've got whiplash right now. <laughs> so the type of pivoting that I'm doing is like pivoting from digital to analog, analog to digital, et, et cetera. And, um, and it really focuses on sort of some, uh, some uh, parts of myself that encompass both those two institutions. So I'm going to, and I'm going to talk about them in, in turn. So first and foremost, in at the film center, you know, the last five years have been about VR, 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 and immersive media. And so I've been producing all sorts of VR media works. In fact, um, I don't know when that was, Jason, but we, I think we were, we worked with Scalinetti and Adtech Island a long time ago, where we actually uh, did the first uh, uh, VR exp like it was when Oculus came out. The first version of Oculus came out, and we hacked into Second Life so that we could have real-time conversations with characters <laughs> in Concordia in their avatar form in Abtec Island at Hot Docs. So that was like, you know, one of our first uh, forays into that. And so, you know, and, and so that's, so VR, that's one. And then I'm, I'm gonna go back to all of these guys. So VR uh, is something that I'm kind of uh, quite, uh, I see myself as, as a producer of that. At the same time, I've been producing theater. Like I actually, I only produce one piece of theater, but it's been like for 10 years, this musical that I've been involved in for 10 years in different forms. And we were finally getting a chance to do a major workshop at Citadel Theater um, when COVID hit. So I've had to rethink how that impacted, okay? And then there's, um, you know, as a mother. So, uh, you know, having to deal with the child at home figuring out what to do, do we, do we engage him with him in, uh, in terms of how much screen time does he get, how much not screen time, how do we deal with schooling, all that sort of stuff. And then obviously this new job of opening up the school and thinking about the impact as it relates to both, how do you build a culture and a community when you've never met any of the people <laughs> or you've met like some of the people in this new, in this new gig, right? And, but there's, 300 of them that you've never met before. And then God knows what the students are all gonna be like. So because of all those just different pieces of my life, I've had to kind of have very specific um, uh, notions of what the pivot means, what this pivot means. In terms of VR, um, I think my biggest pivot, even though it seems completely almost like like a non-brainer that this would save everyone during COVID times, right? Um, I just, for example, tried the Star Wars with my son. We, I don't know if anyone has tried uh, the, the new Star Wars game where you're actually inside the Millennium Falcon flying around and you've got your, your, you know, your buddy in a different uh, starship and you're doing something. I mean, it's phenomenal, right? But at the same time, you're so clearly thinking Jesus, like no one can do this. Like there's just not enough headsets out there. And then further, you're like, and Facebook just made the Oculus, you know, the the new um, Quest. Uh, Facebook, uh, uh, you need to have Facebook sign it. And so wow. I cannot possibly keep going in this direction because from a political standpoint, it is just so fraught with so much so many problems, right? So a lot of the work I do is also in the democracy space. And certainly, you know, I've been a critique of, as, as Jason knows, of, um, you know, the technology mon monopolies that we're now being subjected to um, and uh, oppressed by. And um, certainly, even though we know this is the space that we can find such beauty in as artists and as, as makers of content, 
Um, the tech stack is so problematic that I don't that that so that pivot that's that's a that's like a whiplash that's going on that hasn't resolved itself yet. Um, mm -hmm. The only light that I can see is potentially AR. Um, so, because you can use similar production techniques, but then this is way more accessible perhaps, and there's things that you can do. So that's one. Um, in the theater space, I mean, that's just a whole other, I mean, I just, uh, it's, 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 it's frightening what's going on in that particular realm, you know? Um, I think there's tons of people who are, who are uh, valiantly trying to reimagine what that looks like. And for us, uh, you know, in particular, what we're trying to do is think of a, a, a what does a what does a workshop look like in Zoom, basically? You know, it's a musical that we're making. So, <laughs> musical and Zoom, they don't go together. <laughs> so they haven't figured out how to mix audio through these through these channels, right? So having a live musical reading in Zoom is impossible. So then you have to go, okay, how do I take Tau and the get down up down i don't know if everyone's seen that video came out in may it's like the best zoom music video of all time um like so we're thinking okay can we do a screen work script workshop using those types of techniques and so all of a sudden you get kind of excited because this is such a constrained form that it becomes such a an exciting form because it's so constrained <laughs> that you're starting to think okay how, what would happen if we start to think of each box as a as a wormhole that we have to go into? And then what what happens to the narrative if each of these boxes are narrative wormholes? So all of a sudden, from a from a theater perspective, um, it can become exciting, but there's always that w hint of nostalgia that it's never going to be quite the same as if you're there in in real life, right? And then in terms of the mother part. Um, uh, the single most important technology that I think uh, I pivoted to, and I would buy stocks on it, like if I mean, if I had tons of money, is Discord. So it's really about the primacy and immediacy of audio that has driven a lot of the kind of, um, I think that has impacted uh, much of the sort of need for connection that I know my kid has, right? So. Uh, you know, I read a lot about the mental health of kids, and I think that's probably true. But honestly, because we allowed him to play video games and to hang out with, like, we, this was the only way he could hang out with friends. And the, the, and the only way he could have fun with friends was he just happened to be uh, uh, playing games that had Discord on it so that they could chat the whole time, right? So that really, to me, the audio part, so the, so, thinking about liveness. And so thinking about the relationship between liveness, immediacy, um, intimacy, connection, as you're navigating even different uh, cyber locations or cyber spaces, I think is something that's kind of interesting. And it's also, there's a notion of the persistence of audio that is different from the persistence of the visual uh, form, which I think is also interesting. So. Um, that's something that I'm kind of grappling with. And then, so all of that stuff I take into account as I now move into this other place called the university and where we're trying to go, okay, how do we make, how do we make um, um, school? <laughs> like that, how do we create those, those feelings of connection and intimacy? Now, the good news is as president, I don't actually have to think about that. And there's a whole slew of really, really smart faculty people who are doing a tremendous amount of work in that in that space, um, but they're thinking exactly about these same things, which is, you know, how do you provide access? Um, how do you so asynchronous learning becomes a, a key thing? Um, and uh, most people think that the best way to do, teach is to do the Zoom thing, and there is a place for that, but never underestimate the 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 the, the need for 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 access for any time, any place type of um, yeah. um, access to, to the learning uh, experience, right? And that has actually uh, proven to be quite an important thing for students. Um, the other thing too is this need for connection. So really building in, what is that persistent, what's that persistent media form where people feel that they're still connected to each other 
even though they things might not be on. And, and I don't think we've answered that yet. I'm not sure what that is. So we're experimenting with a variety of things that are that 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 um, we're thinking of, but they're not quite. We're not quite sure if they're going to work. So yeah, I think I, I'll stop there. Yeah. No worries. I was just going to say I think too. It's like I I think those are good questions to just pose. And I like even today I did a talk with the AGO and the panelists. We only had like thirty minutes to talk, and and we actually stayed on the Zoom call for another forty five minutes because people felt like we had only just like barely scratched the surface. And I think partly it's, you know, and I'm going to then, you know, lean on Nikki because, you know, with all this incredible programming that they were doing with Imaginative and the same thing that we're doing with uh, the Indigenous delegation at MIT, it's like, as much as I don't like the idea of sitting on the screen any longer, because I actually don't want to hang out on it. But then I realized that I miss my friends and colleagues and those kind of like spontaneous connections, dialogues, meeting new people um, that can't happen actually without having some kind of a virtual hangout space or just how you said some kind of space that's live, that's open, that people can, can engage with. And I think that that's gonna be a really interesting conundrum as we kind of continue to move forward. I mean, we don't see there being any kind of like real end date in sight right now. We definitely know that, um, you know, this kind of um, virtualness is, is not going to go away. And I definitely say that, like, you know, how do we think about, you know, like we make jokes that imaginative is like, is like indigenous people's Christmas, you know? And so it's like to not actually be in the physical space, getting to see everybody being part of those events, I think is going to be a really huge shift. And, and, and Nikki, if you want to talk a little bit about how you guys have programmed and work towards thinking about how to get those kinds of engagement through a virtual event. Sure, thanks for everyone sharing their thoughts so far. It's really a lot of good things just to think about and like writing notes as we go. And I think, um, you know, I've been in Imaginative, this is my second festival. Uh, last year was the first one and this year I was like, sweet, now I know what I'm doing. And then everything happened. Um, so it's been really interesting for us. Uh, I, Naomi uh, Johnson, started off as executive director like a month right after me so it's been really lovely that working in tandem with her i have to say to be able to she made the decision really early out in march saying like we're just going online um and so i was really happy that you know that was quick we were able to just then shift focus right away to put to um to research and to figure out how we're going to do with it how we're going to pivot and how we're going to get together because so much of indigenous gathering is just getting together sharing meals um networking i like to call it fall camp because I think about the fall equinox. So I'm trying to get that going, but nobody's getting behind me. But um, fall camp is better than Christmas because I don't really like Christmas, but I liked it. I like the analogy that people get excited about it. You know, well, I can walk yeah. you through the line. We gather, <laughs> we have our harvest we're bringing, we're bringing our, our works, we're networking, we're sharing our ideas. Like we're also socializing and you know sharing food and 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 celebrating each other in that in the harvest so um that's my pitch for it hopefully it will become a, a viral thing i doubt it anyway so we moved on so we moved online quite quickly and the thing with that's you so unique about imaginative is we also have we have film and, and video which is quite strong and last year we became an oscar qualifying festival for short format live action which is amazing first indigenous festival to do so and then we also have a component of media arts. And I think, you know, for Imaginative, that's quite key because that's sort of how we came in to film and video, to actually having space in those, in those worlds is through artists working in different mediums, um, artists, I think like indigenous artists and, in, in, and innovation quite in tandem and think it's like, you know, they're working with innovation. We've always been innovative. We've always worked with tools and these are new tools that we're telling stories with. And so um, for me, I think it's like, quite nice uh, that we are going online and actually making more emphasis for sort of artists that are working in the digital realm, uh, the collaborations that we have, like for, we are, we partner with Trinity Square Video, which is really amazing. And we partnered with you last year and Jason as well. We have ongoing partnerships with, with you. And so I think for us, like just being able to say like all of these artists are working fluidly, like between all of these spaces and in remarkable ways. Um, is so important and that binary of like film versus media this is weird media oh that's just like weird industry film like why can't those um, kind of have more dialogues and I'm hoping that this like this moment I think for us specifically is where those things can maybe have more crossover 
um, people can engage and, ex and discover how many different artists we have. This year we have, um, I think 159 Indigenous artists represented um, through all of the works in 98 different nations. And so for us, um, thinking through platforms and thinking through how we can move forward with that, you know, considering how our audiences are going to engage with us, you know, um, internet speed and access to technology is a huge um, issue for Indigenous communities. And I think for us, that was like something that we wanted to look at right away. So we did a survey of our audiences and got the feedback and sort of wondered, I saw where people are accessing work. And I think for us, that was key in terms of that too. And some of the things that I'm constantly kind of thinking about in this space is sort of that has come up already through other folks um, is sort of like, why are we putting this on online or in this digital realm in this way? Like, does it need to, what's the value in it? What are we valuing for it? Um, I find for myself um, in this role, and I guess just my own practice is like being super conscious about consumption. Um, and I feel like being in COVID and the consumption culture online of like people just, you know, we need more content, we need more content. And like, how do we can, how do we support slow? <laughs> how do we support like meaningful work and um, maybe that connectivity that some things have come up and how do we make those things um, yeah, you can feel them, that, that they can be a part of it. And so that's been a kind of a key for us to trying to think through the festival um, because so much of a part of it is gathering. And I think I have to commend the team um, for producing, for being overachievers. Um, I think it's, we launched on Tuesday and I think everyone will be quite impressed with sort of what we've been able to do. And it's been opened up some, it's opened up spaces for us to be able to connect with artists and get some recordings right away uh, of people that wouldn't maybe necessarily be there, but also to be able to share a welcome song from a more international perspective, um, be able to connect with, with our international uh, nations in a, in a different way. And then also, um, yeah, I think one thing that we wanted to ground it in this year and thinking about specifically the pandemic is um, like, how what are the needs of our audiences like I know artists gigs are kind of like at the beginning we're getting cuts we're being shifted we're being like all of this stuff so money was just getting you know out of the artist right away and so for us we were in a privileged position in that the funders and everyone was like all of this money was coming to you know support the organizations to keep going to what's your pivot let's figure it out and so we were really concerned about what is the what's the artist going to do how can we ensure that they're getting really good artist fees because right now it's also the wild west in terms of like how, how long is the duration? What is the access point for people, for audiences to engage with the work? Like, what are the barriers for the artists? Because I feel like artists right away, when everything went in lockdown, provided the hope, provided like the vision for people to keep going because they just put their work up online for people to share, for people to enjoy. And so I think for us, like that was something. So we were able to, like myself, Jason Ryle, who's previous executive director, and Naomi kind of came together and just talked and decided to do a giveaway. We've always wanted to do, do a giveaway. And a giveaway is often different in different nations. And I think just around Indigenous reciprocity, Indigenous gift giving. And so it's been really nice to be able to like think about that and sort of not like, not think about the digital pivot, but think about how are we going to give back to this community in like tangible ways that people need things. <laughs> and um, so we are happy to announce that we've like, we're able to manage and pivot with our funders and sponsors to be able to give away 53,000, I think, in awards this year. Um, we're able to give an incredible, like more of the biggest artist fees we've been able to do for our screening folks. And then also, I think over $20,000 in giveaways to actual audience members. And that ranges from health and wellness, indigenous artists that we're working with to commission works. And then also just like, you know, gift cards to Sobeys because who doesn't need $500 worth of groceries right now? Because that's something that I could need. And so I think we also got you know, Northwest Company down board too, to because that's what all the grocery stores are in Northern Reserves, are Northern stores. So these are the kinds of things that we really wanted to touch on while we were pivoting to think of like, and our platforms are supposed to be able to adapt to the different broad bandwidths that people have. So hopefully like, you know, in small, slower communities that it will adjust its stream to figure that out. And I know, and I like hear Anna and some of the things about where we're getting the tech from, for me, that's really challenging. Cause then, you know, we're doing all of these things where we can, but then I'm thinking about, well, where is, where is the platform coming from? Who owns that? And I'm just like, I can't, I don't wanna say it, <laughs> but um, you know, it's unfortunate, I think in those things. And it's like, how can we support like 
open software or things that are still that can be safe that we can adjust or that artists are already doing and producing that technology and how can we get money to them and help them do that work to support our stuff too so i think like you know thinking about indigenous economies in that way and then also doing that for how we work in terms of like indigenous economies for that not only tech but also with the artists who we're employing and all that kind of stuff to keep it local yeah it's it's so important and i think you guys have just done such an incredible job and it's been it's been really amazing to kind of like witness um and i know that i know uh from firsthand experience it's it's difficult work and so i think that it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see where we go and then how the future kind of holds maybe some really incredible hybrid models of like really strong kind of like virtual content of even going back to what Brooke said about getting those bits of information out to people that would have never been able to come into Sydney to come and 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 witness the exhibition the way that that you would want them to and that there's these kind of like really nice transmissions that are even happening you know um even though you know the example that Anna said about Facebook and the Oculix it's just like it, you know that that the same way that we communicate through media has been able allowed us to mobilize globally and have these kind of really strong global conversations. And, and I'm hopeful that media is going to, not media as in like social media, but digital media will allow us those tools and platforms to keep pushing, you know, those boundaries. I know, Emily, you guys have done such great work at Trinity Square Video, and you've been such a strong advocate for digital media artists um, in your independent practice and also in your role as the director. And so you want to talk a little bit about your the work that you've done. And I think it'd be, I think it'd be a fair reign to like, you know, talk about, um, you know, not, not just as a rant, but as the, as our, as our reality is that, you know, we've got this really incredible group of people who have been doing work for a really long period of time. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be great to hear from you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Julie. And thanks everyone. I'm really happy and excited to get into this. Um, so I guess I'll just, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about how TSV moved forward, um, moving online. Uh, luckily, I don't want to say luckily or fortunately, you know, we're forced to do this, but 2021, a lot of the programming that we had scheduled had the capacity to exist online. So, um, so we kind of pushed forward, um, but we really wanted to push forward with uh, a lot of intention and a lot of thoughtfulness um, and also um, a lot of care for the artists and curators that we we're working with since nobody was at 100 percent so we tried to be as resourceful as possible and using existing works or existing platforms just in the beginning um, to kind of alleviate that stress and pressure to to get online in a way that has been i think we can all agree very under under explored in <laughs> terms of the larger context sort of thing so it was a lot of pressure, you know, our media arts center. So it was like, what are you gonna do? Um, so not, it was pretty intense and pretty stressful in the first few months, but I think we kind of caught our bearings. And uh, obviously before scheduling everything, we made sure to give the artists the options to postpone because I appreciate the value in having artists occupy physical space. So there was always that that conversation outright, but just to speak about a few programs that we're able to translate online. Um, starting uh, last April, uh, we hosted a data visualization project with Tierra Roxanne um, about uh, uh, data colonialism and her ongoing research uh, into the embedded biases in machine learning, particularly when it came to uh, the statistical and census data uh, for Indigenous folks across uh, North America. So this, um, the main component of the exhibition was actually a website kind of outlining the, the bias and the, and the various injustices associated to data colonialism. So that wasn't a, a hard leap uh, to go online, but we, um, we had to kind of take into account how people were gonna navigate the website. Um, obviously entering a gallery is different than opening a website and trying to go through the process of, uh, of, of learning what the data visualization was going to be. So we had to take that into account. But um, in tandem with the website, there was also a Zoom performance, Tiara's first Zoom performance, which is very interesting, kind of a performance happening in the square, um, the square of Zoom. And Anna, I, I'm totally uh, with you there about the Zoom constraints and kind of 
trying to play with that a little bit, but that was uh, early on in April. Um, and then also there was a conversation with her friend, her best friend who knew her work too. So we really wanted to keep it loose, um, wanted to be comfortable uh, as we were trying to navigate these online ways of, of public presentation. Uh, the following exhibition was Performing Lives, uh, which was curated by Zoe Chan, who's a Vancouver curator. And the exhibition had already shown in Montreal in 2018. So we thought that this would be a good opportunity to make an online exhibition um, since all the works were video works, there are five video works. So really we just used a simple Squarespace template and did a little design in the back end. Um, it was like a very clean blog-like uh, website, but what was kind of special and nice with the, is that there was an opportunity to include like ephemeral material and documentation from the production and any kind of like commentary that Zoe would like to add just, you know, in retrospect. So that was kind of an interesting uh, <laughs> pivot. We're going to use the continual word pivot, but uh it was nice to kind of think of the archive in a different way uh, when it comes to the potential of online exhibitions and what you can incorporate in an exhibition space online. Um, so that was, that was, and then also you could like learn about the analytics, like who was tuning in from where and uh, just another form of like audience um, information, audience engagement. Uh, and then this fall, we have a few online projects that are launching. Uh, our annual theme commission is online. We're co-presenting with Dames Making Games, who's a, a art uh, game-based organization here in Toronto. Originally, the works were gonna be, the new commission works were gonna be exhibited in the TMAC building where Dames Making Games is located, but um, we made the quick decision to just do it online and games existing online. It's again, a nice, uh, a nice easy uh, transition. I don't want to say easy. I have to stop like casualing it up. It's, <laughs> it's a whole other realm of, of operation, which I appreciate. But, um, but instead of like thinking about how uh, people play in public spaces, it was uh, about how you play in remote locations. So kind of concentrating on um, this, form of, of play uh, with friends and kind of diving into the intimacies um, of, you know, you on your switch on your bed sort of thing. So kind of translating uh, uh, just the, the way we, we approach the concept of play. Um, and then we just launched uh, two days ago, um, our online publication, transmedia publication, Virtual Grounds, which we are uh, doing with the Digital Justice Lab. And um, it's a one-year program that was focused on education and research uh, dedicated to feminist perspectives in digital survivor, survival and sustainability. So kind of the things that Nikki, you're talking about and same with you, Anna, about uh, safety online and uh, thinking about the various platforms that we use and dangers with surveillance and um, facial recognition and um, machine learning bias and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, it's a big research project and it'll turn into a publication that will be launched um, in steps online uh, throughout the fall. Um, so really pumped about that. But again, moving forward, um, we're still trying to be resourceful. I think like we can all maybe chat about money eventually and how like digital initiatives are, are relatively underfunded, um, particularly in Canada. So, or there are very few opportunities to kind of really geek out about this medium and geek out about the various exhibitions, online exhibition spaces that we could potentially build. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of for now work with the assets that we have. We have a, a, a VR or, um, a mobile app um, that you can use on your phone that you can watch uh, VR and 360 video works. Uh, we're gonna do a few new commissions this fall and in the winter time. And then we also have a 3D rendering of the exhibition space, that the gallery space that was made in 2017 by a company called Janus VR. So we're gonna like fiddle around with that and also um, kind of get into more research creation projects and, and play around with the residency format a little bit. So, so yeah, 
stay tuned. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. I was just going to say we got like three minutes. So I was just going to say uh, maybe like favorite, uh, you know, like a, a digital media, something that you like, like in the last uh, few months, what's something that you're excited about? Or maybe a wish list of, you know, like, you know, a special a special chair, Jason, or like, you know, something to do with, um, you know, what, what's a, a kind of like thing that you want to see happen in the future for, for digital media? Who wants to go? Oh, you're muted. Hi oh, there. Um, so I've been talking about this forever since the pandemic started because I thought it was the coolest thing that I've seen in a long time. And it's it's called the Coexis Dance Festival. Has anyone heard of it? No? Okay, so these these folks have basically been doing these dance festivals in, in real life, except what they do is they get a composer or a musician and then a dancer and they pair them up, but they've never met each other. And then they put them in the same room and the musician plays and then the dancer uh, moves to the music that she or he hears, okay? And so when the pandemic hit, they started to do these Facebook live performances, except that the musician was in their own room watching a Zoom <laughs> window of the dancer and the dancer had the Zoom uh, uh, audio uh, available or they got the audio feed somehow. And then they would do these live streamed performances in totally different places, completely improvisationally. And it was one of the most compelling things I had ever seen. And, you know, they are the only kind of art troupe that I've seen to date since the pandemic started, that's really tried to get, get some form of, uh, again, this notion of liveness, it, like, and, and intimacy, well, I don't even, I don't even feel like it was intimate. It was just such an odd thing to be watching on Facebook, but it really, really worked. And you're riveted because you're kind of trying to figure out what's going to happen next, you know, like how can the dancer feel? How are they going to move? What are they going to do? So I thought that was really cool. Um, and uh, so it's their Toronto dance um, festival company. And then just one more thing, um, uh, sorry, shameless plug, but um, uh, one of the things that happened when the pandemic hit is uh, we said, gosh, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna, how are we gonna galvanize the arts and culture community to be seen as, the, as a catalytic force to get people out of their homes and buying stuff on, on main streets? And so we worked with the city to essentially map out um, projectionable spaces in Toronto across 25 wards. So uh, we have this now festival in collaboration with the city of Toronto, we meaning OCAD U, um, and AVA, AVA Animation has this festival in collaboration with the city of Toronto between now and December um, to project into public walls um, across the city and the 25 wards. And I think that's an interesting model is like, maybe we got to just take the art outside. So this the like, thank God we're going into the year of public art. There you go. See, Julie. I know, I was like, year. isn't that what I'm doing? I was like, I was like, but hey, I'm not actually allowed to because it will draw a million people. So I couldn't I be outside. I was not allowed. I know, I know. Well, it has to just be, but the thing is it was because it was for one night. But if you prolong yeah. it for the rest of our lives, then that's really what we want. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. Anybody else want to jump in? I don't want to cut anybody off. So wish list. Jason, you're you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Call someone out. <laughs> My most enjoyable thing was actually has actually been the 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 Scott Pilgrim Saves the World movie cast did a table read uh as a as a group and it was it was actually phenomenally more enjoyable than i thought i thought it was going to be kind of nice and cute but it was really great and part of it was the liveness that we're talking about part of it was was um they kept everybody up on the screen all at the same time so that you could sort of watch everybody even when it wasn't their scene sort of kind of like doing their thing but it was a it was a really interesting way to kind of bridge between you know these actors as people and these actors who are, you know, extremely good at their craft at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really compelling. And actually the, the whole, it was, it was both of Scott Winati and I, and our 16 year old and our 13 year old uh, watched it and really enjoyed it. So 
there was something about just that simple it's it's the audio like anna was saying like it's like the the liveness of it and also sort of like the weird kind of familiar you know famous people in your living room uh sort of uh combination yeah i'd have to agree i love just having access to all these panels online and and all that but i had so much fun with the AR works uh, for Nuit Blanche. Like we had a whole day, oh man, it was just like a photo shoot. And it was such a great way to just experience art and get out of the space and, and to go outside. And, and uh, I loved it. I think there could definitely be more programming like that. And there were so many options. It wasn't just like one piece. So yeah, it was I also like the versatility. I like some had sound some you could make massive, some rotated, you could film, like I just, the incredibleness of being able to take that work anywhere, you know, like seeing the posts, like I see Leuli yeah. in the chat, like seeing Leuli in chorus posts on the other side of the planet or one in the subarctic, you know, like it's just, it was just such an incredible um, uh, win, I think that you, where you could take, where you can take it, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thanks, Ra, I appreciate that. That was unsolicited. <laughs> I mean, I was going to mention that one too. Like, <laughs> it, it, they were beautiful works, and I loved, like, even just thinking about the usability of how to access them. You didn't have to download an app, it was very simple. And yeah, it was nice to just explore, which is, you know, what is necessary for Nuit Blanche and to, to see digital art as public art. Um, I've also been really into memes and I've been following some pretty hilarious Instagram accounts. So I, I hate to say that that would be my favorite thing right now, but. Should we break out into Fleetwood Mac now? I was like. Oh no. yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone there it is. <laughs> I love dog face. Is that yeah. your page, Nikki? <laughs> what? Is that your home screen? <laughs> That's on my Instagram, yes. Well, because last night, I'm not gonna lie, I ran to Jason Momoa, and then I was like, I gotta listen to our like favorite uncle right now, and I just put yeah, that. exactly. And I was like, awesome. Do exactly. You know, <laughs> how about you, Brooke? Any favorites? Well, look, I'm just saying I'm really enjoying all this happiness now because it's actually been really tough um, for Indigenous communities, and especially for us, like. Um, I, I don't know if you are following what's happening in Australia, but all the states and territories have their own um, powers within um, the government. It's not actually um, run by the federal um, government because of Federation in 1901. So, <clears throat> excuse me, all the boundaries are closed and borders. And so it's also hard to get out to traditional lands. And I think that if anything, it's highlighting the issues and urgency that I know that a lot of you have been talking about tonight um, in solidarity, and that is, Indigenous communities having access to high-speed um, internet, actually around issues of healing, you often go out to country to heal. Um, and I think that, uh, I suppose there's one plus side about this is that connecting with uh, students, but also family members over Zoom, it's actually changing the culture of what Zoom was actually created for. So normally it was very formal, you know, it was kind of quite boring lectures, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the kind of format and how that's actually done and driven is really shifted a lot. But um, I, I, yeah, sure, the kind of meme stuff's really fun, but most people don't have phones or, do you know what I mean? I don't mean to be a downer, but I just think that it actually in a positive way, if I can say that, it kind of highlights actually what's missing and hopefully mm -hmm. um, the kind of so-called, you know, mil multiple millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, which is pumped into Indigenous communities often goes into the coffers of, you know, normally non-Indigenous governments or corporations, sorry, um, non-Indigenous managers or corporations that spat out the side. And where does that, where is the outcome for that? And I think that it's highlighting a lot of those, those issues at the moment. So I'm hoping for um, whatever, I don't even want to talk about post-COVID because in fact, if anything, COVID was kind of a blessing in disguise because it highlighted all of these kind of problems with the way in which that the structure and the government's um, education system, et cetera, is all set up. Um, but yeah, that's... Oh, I <laughs> think... I definitely see there's some changes in that area as well. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Nikki, you want the last word there, my dear? Well, no, I was just going to say, Brooke, like, 
one thing that I, you know, I was a near in and I was, I was so excited. Then I had to leave early because Julie's like, we should probably go. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but because I don't think I met half of you either. Like it was just really chaotic. Mm -hmm. And I think for the website afterwards, that I think that really emulated with me that was really simple is that when you go to the website, the the indigenous land acknowledgement was right there and it was like you have to go through that little moment for me I think was just like really interesting to think about how people are going to be working now and especially pivoting all of these organizations to online and so how do we continue to like ensure people are thinking about those things moving forward and I, I think like we sort of we gleaned that for sure because that was the one thing I was like you know I really loved how grounded uh the, Bi the Biennale was in Indigenous practices and thought. And so I really enjoyed like that little moment for me, just in terms of that part was so meaningful. And I, you know, we, I think that was so important and just highlights all of the other things that like a little tip into like all of the other social issues that are happening and that we're constantly talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that the digital platform, like no one really owns that, right? So there's no issues of colonization. There's, if anything, there's issues of, you know, ongoing maybe kind of, corporatization or kind of like that cultural space. And I think that's what um, even Jason was talking about in regards to, you know, those um, kind of imaginative places that you can go to, what's it called, First Life or something? I don't really... Second Life. <laughs> Second Life, I'm not into that gaming stuff my son is, that's for sure, but um, I'm a bit of an old man um, when it comes to that. But I think that it's important to know that they're fresh spaces, right? We can kind of do whatever we want. I think it's what's so empowering about this whole panel is that that's what we've all been doing and many other people as well. It's really a great way to feel great and good about it. And even that, that basic um, thing that you were talking about, Nikki, of like, you know, having the welcome to country or acknowledgement of country. I mean, that happens on many museums here, but I've been working in um, some museums you know projects like in the USA and stuff and I'm so surprised that 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 hasn't happened and that even working you know with and talking with some of the um uh like a panel at the Getty like they want to get a First Nations kind of group together and they want to acknowledge that it's like oh, it's not actually that hard you know but but they have this kind of bureaucratic institutionalized system that buckles them that cripples them that for us it's the opposite, you know, we're on the kind of opposite side of the mirror. It's like, uh, we've been doing this for ages. Like, you know, can we just like move on now? And um, yeah, and it's great to, to, to meet you all and, and know about all the awesome and inspiring work that you've been doing for a long time as well. Yeah, I want to say, I want to reiterate that. Well, that's where we'll leave. And I want to say, Chi Miigwech, Marcy, thank you for bringing your good hearts, good minds to the virtual square boxes that we're currently now living in. And I just, uh, I'm so thankful for your guys' work and energy and all the bits that you bring to the table. And I, I normally have to do like a, like a proper closing, but I'm going to kind of rush today and I might get in trouble. So number one, Nui Independent Projects is now open. So please uh, join, log in, join it, do whatever you got to do. And I want to say Chi Miigwech Marcy to Noor Banku, who's been my research assistant and helping with all the talks. And she's like secretly behind the scenes doing all the bits. And I uh, totally adore her. And I just want to make sure she gets credit where credit's due. And I want to say thanks to the city of Toronto for being, uh, you know, for like standing by me and like making sure that this entire thing happened. And I think that we totally, um, you know, really pushed people's comfort zones in terms of thinking about what a virtual uh, public art exhibition could be. And so I'm really thankful and I'm so thankful that we've had over 40 speakers over the last few weeks and the podcasts are going to continue and we're going to pick up the speaker series in the new year. And so thank you so much for everybody for coming along on this crazy ride. Chi Miigwech, Marcy, thanks guys. Thanks, Julie. Thanks all. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.